Hi, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rania Bautista with the Aspen Institute's Sports and Society team. Thank you all for joining us here today uh, during a critical movement in our society. Kids and families today are facing extreme anxiety, trauma, anger, and grief. Uh, emotions that are not only tied to the COVID moment, but also to the continued racial injustices against communities of color. Injustices that are perpetuated by a system that was designed to oppress black and brown communities. And again, in recent light expressed through the horrendous police brutality and active attempts to repress protests that show the world that black lives matter. Kids often turn to sports as a place to heal so how can we make sure that the adults that shape their sport experiences are intentional about their role and the role of the environment to ensure uh, that kids feel safe and supported? Life skills are and will ever more so need to be central to kids' participation in sports, especially when we return to play. Skills defined by the tools that support kids' ability to internalize and respond to the impact of the world around them Today, we will be looking at a subset of those skills focused on mental health and social and emotional well being. Addressing the full spectrum of coaches from parent volunteer to elite performance, sports are a critical space for kids to develop these life skills, and particularly exploring how we can prepare and support coaches to look at the role of race, gender, sexual orientation, and their environment um, when developing a plan to support young athletes' mental health. Over the next few months, Project Play will be building on our Calls for Coaches framework, which uh, my colleague John has put into the chat box, to, uh, to release a series of resources that focus on supporting coaches in taking the steps to be intentional in their role to develop social and emotional skills with their athletes and create the environment to foster those skills. So today we will be speaking with leaders of practice, coaches and a young athlete to define the problem, discuss concrete ideas to support coaches in creating the physically and emotionally uh, protective spaces for their athletes, and discuss the next steps in prioritizing life skills as we return to play. A couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. We want you to participate in this conversation and you can do so in two ways. The chat function um, at the bottom at the bottom of your screens uh, is where you can share your thoughts. John Solomon, our editorial director, will be hosting that part of the conversation and will post any related links. And you can also use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to send questions to our panelists. We will also send a recap of this conversation, including the video recording after the webinar. And we hope that you'll share on social with the hashtag Project Play and tag us at Aspen in Sports. Today, we are joined by our panelists, Rebecca Roulier, COO of Doc Wayne Youth Services, Donald Curtis, founder and executive director of Seoul, Keyshawn Hunter, uh, an HD Woodson High School football player and Old Dominion University recruit, and Chris Moore, CEO of Positive Coaching Alliance. Welcome to you all and let's get started. Uh, to start us off, we are going to turn to you, Rebecca, to help us set the stage. Uh, so at this point, Rebecca, I'll ask you to come on in. Hello, everyone. Thank you to the Aspen Institute for the opportunity to speak today and for spotlighting mental health. And as we launch into this topic, for everyone who's listening today, I just encourage you to take a moment for yourself as helpers and as supporters of our community. So as the health of our communities continue to improve during this pandemic, it's important to note that we are just at the beginning of a secondary mental health pandemic. The implications of social isolation and the stress upon all of us will continue for years according to the World Health Organization. And it's even more vital that we not only lean on the provider community, but turn towards other known and trusted helpers in the community such as coaches. 
And although most are not working in a professional capacity, there are 6.5 million coaches in the United States, which far outnumbers the mental health professionals uh, such as myself who struggle with workforce shortages and long wait lists. So coaches uh, are our front lines of defense and the ones who kids trust. So thank you for all of you who are on this call who are coaches. Next slide, please. So coaches are vital in a number of ways, but the key to their influence is that their work is relationship centric and that relationships with these young people harness the power of sport, which we all know um, is the global language of young people. And in understanding the COVID situation and all of the stressors that were mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, stress in general isn't necessarily bad for young people. For example, um, if you go through a two minute drill or you're on the field and you're in a really difficult situation, some of that anxiety can really make you a better player. So if you're training, um, the next time you're in that situation, you may do it better. So when stress is buffered by caring relationships like parents or coaches, you can gain skills from it and learn to navigate situations better for the future. Um, but when it's not, and it lasts for lengthy periods of time, it can alter the brain and inhibit your ability to learn, results in poor behaviors and ultimately results in poor life outcomes. So coaches um, buffer this stress, act as community connectors to a variety of different services, providers, educators, um, other trusted people in the community. They model good relationships, good boundaries, um, good social skills, and they ultimately build better performers on and off the field. So we're not just talking about life skills and mental health, we're, but we're also talking about performers in general. Next slide, slide please. So how exactly do we do this and how do we do this well? Especially with kids coming back to the field with more and more challenges. Um, I think this is where we look to reimagine youth sports, coach education and truly leverage the power of the coach. So first you must start with yourself. Um, and that's where we look to regulation and coach regulation. And for the coach to really make the most impact, they must be regulated because you can't regulate someone else until you're regulated yourself. So to do that, um, I'm recommending that coaches develop coping skills. So that could be as easy as your own experience in sport, exercise, deep breathing, texting a friend, watching a funny movie, but doing things that make you feel better in your life. And we're taught through sports to use warm ups and cool downs in the sport context, but we often don't use them um, in conversations with our athletes or in life in general. So we're involved in a lot of challenging conversations right now. So teach yourself to take a deep breath before a hard conversation and to reflect back on it but also finding mentors or trusted friends to download these experiences um, and um, plan for your future and have these conversations in non-player spaces so that you're creating a space for yourself and also accessing affordable mental health services. So we can't expect our players to access these services unless we're utilizing them as well. And then the second one is to create safe spaces. Um, so there's a number of techniques that you can use to create a safe space. One is using your voice as a tool to so using your relaxed tone of voice. And if you talk really fast and really quick, then you're going to create some more anxiety for your athlete, but helping them into a regulated state by using that tone of voice. Also asking open-ended questions reflecting on feelings that come up. So if you hear some things in your conversations with your athletes, reflect that back and say, I hear you are anxious, or I hear you are worried about that, or I hear you're very excited about this upcoming game, or I hear you're excited that we're re-entering sport. 
and incorporating choice and age appropriate responses. So with choice, um, a good example is when you're building expectations into your teams is give them that opportunity, give them the opportunity to create those rules and expectations for your teams, but also design drills and games for practices that teach mental health skills. Oftentimes we leave mental health for um, off the field or refer to others, but we can get the most out of practice time for physical and mental skills. Um, and I'll go back to this at the end of my presentation about how exactly you do this. But once you do that, give praise for specific skills accomplished and always debrief. So don't just assume that your athletes are connecting the dots, but make sure you touch base with them and check for understanding. Finally, uh, include mental health in your strategy and your team culture. So discuss mental health as part of your game plan and show them examples of athletes who discuss mental health openly. So there's lots of great ones these days. Kevin Love is a good example, Hannah Hall, um, talking about mental health, their struggles, their victories. You can find them on YouTube pretty easily. So send them to your athletes. And then again, touch base with them and process with them, talk to them about how that might help them in life, but also as a performer, because that's what's really going to connect with kids, but how they can be a better athlete. And then mix a check-in with them about their game with a mental health check-in. So this doesn't have to be something that's uncomfortable as a coach, but you can say, did you get a hundred um, touches on the ball at home? But also were you focused and were you able to concentrate or was there something that was going on in your head? And do you wanna check in with me about that? And then lastly, make referrals for mental health just as you would for physical health and have a list of preferred providers. So it's a lot for coaches to take on to think about um, all of the different things that might come up in a conversation with their athlete, but there's a lot of people out there that can help you. So you wanna create a referral list and when something comes up, you'll have the number that can help you and help your athlete. So you probably have a list like this for strength and conditioning or physical therapy. Um, you wanna add these mental health resources onto that list. And pointing out what does this accomplish for your athletes, for your team? It gives them life skills, it gives them mental health skills and capacity, but it really also gives them performance. And this is where we need to shift the conversation around, around mental health um, for coaches and for athletes, that this is a true pillar of becoming a full athlete who can accomplish the most as a young person. Next slide, please. So I wanted to um, give a few concrete examples of what it looks like on the field. So many practices start with either formal opening circles for the little ones or informal team time and arrival for the older kids. And using this time to check in with your athletes is where you can implement some of the strategies that I mentioned in the previous slide. So checking in with a sport-based prompt. So at Doc Wayne, we use what's your swish and what's your miss in a basketball practice for younger ones. But with the older athletes, you can just walk alongside them as they're getting their gear on um, or as they're getting some touches on the ball with their teammates and just check in with them and ask them again, using some of the language that is parallel to sports psychology around, are you focused? Are you ready? Or is something on your mind? Um, how's it going? And what's impeding your performance? And you can get your foot in the door around mental health. And with this trusted relationship with the student athlete, um, you can begin to open that door to talk about mental health. Um, and as mentioned before, it's time efficient and helpful skill building to design for mental health on the field um, as well as off the field. So for example, if you're playing 2v1, um, which happens in a lot of sports, and you're training your athletes to both convert points quickly on offense, and then for the defenders, you're trying to work on angles and 
um, trying to defend as quickly as possible. Coaches can also debrief about perseverance and overcoming obstacles. So you can throw in a story about maybe Michael Jordan not making his high school basketball team and connecting the 2v1 drill um, and the uneven teams to perseverance and resilience and help per participants um, understand that they overcame an obstacle on the court. So if we're thinking about basketball um, and throw it back at them and ask teams to identify challenges that they have worked through on and off the court and how they did so. So ask them, how did you do that? And really digging for um, answers that are off the court is most helpful. So ask players to identify their current challenges and then discuss potential strategies and solutions and get into a dialogue about that. So that's one way you can use an actual on the field drill to talk about mental health. And then the last um, real life example in a practice that I wanted to talk through was um, Tom Brady, which always pains me to talk about as a Pats fan. Um, but as everyone knows, um, he's playing in his 40s, many Super Bowl championships, and he's played at a high level for 20 plus years. But he's very particular about his self care. He keeps himself on a strict diet, um, his sleep routine. He's in bed as early as 8 30, and he's very careful about his exercise. Um, so Tom Brady is a really great example to talk about performance. He says he wants to be the best he can be every day um, and talking about self-care with kids. Um, so asking them, how, how do you want to be the best you can be? How do you want to be your best possible self? And talking through ways that they can actually care for themselves um, in the Tom Brady example. And again, when they give any example, praising them for their response, asking them how they got to that in terms of their critical thinking skills um, and framing the conversation that way. So to conclude, just wanted to bring us full circle around from expanding from the practical to the bigger picture ideas and wanted to leave with some thoughts that sport can be better um, in the project play reports, we're seeing that some kids are dropping out of sport. Um, and this is our opportunity and reentry to really think carefully and critically about the role of sport in society and how we can infuse these concepts around life skills and mental health into sport across the United States. And just as training programs are rolled out across the US and globally, mental health programming for coaches can be rolled out. Um, and we need to shift the perspective on mental health and sport. So mental health is not just something for the sidelines, but it is something for the field um, and it is something for the full performer and something that everyone needs. And lastly, um, always start with yourself as the coach. So don't roll something out to your athletes without looking internally and doing the hard work within yourself. Thank you. Great, Becky, thank you so much for, for setting the stage for this conversation and guiding us with some uh, concrete examples and exercises to consider as we return to play. Um, Becky is going to stick around to answer questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, but joining us now are Donald Curtis and Keyshawn Hunter, who will speak a bit more about their experiences as mentor and athlete with sports as a tool for mental health support um, and how their experiences have been impacted by our current context and what we hope to see in the future. So thank you so much, Keyshawn and Donald. Uh, thank, you. thank you. So, uh, so Key, I guess we'll we, we do this like we do a uh, men's group. So we'll okay. check in first. All right, so um, uh, give me a word that explains how you feel right now. Uh, one word to explain how I feel right now, uh, more so anxious. Anxious, okay, yeah. why anxious? Because, you know what I'm saying? Because they, they more so, I'm saying that they let more, they trying to give more test trials to see if they're going to let more players in school or process it doing it. I just got the phone my coaches a while back. They saying, oh, we might, we might have to fit something in there. So just hoping that we make it to school one time. 
hoping to make it, I can get into school in time and start doing, get back to doing my sport out of there. That's really that. That's when I well, well, I'm gonna, What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to take it back a little bit. So, um, you know, prior to March, you know, um, you know, student athlete, everything's going a certain way. Uh, can you describe kind of how, like, life was as a student athlete before Corona? Life book. Life as a student athlete before Corona, it was it was lovely, man. It was everything was scheduled out for me. I had everything in order. I I had everything down pat. After school, we got study hall. After study hall, we had workouts. After workouts, you go home. You have you go over. Uh, you have some of your mental. You know what I'm saying, you cool down, take an ice bath, go to sleep, wake up next day, same thing over and over again. So you had everything. You had your whole day planned up for the whole week. Then on your weekends, you cool down, chill with friends, have family members come over, you do your thing. So now, with so much uncertainty, and you builded these habits of, oh yeah, eating right. Oh, I'm working out every day. I'm going away from here. I'm hitting the track here. So now you can't do nothing but sit in the house. It's like, what? It's, it's what's going on now? I'm just sitting in there. You start to freak out a little bit. So then just your thoughts to yourself is, is not right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You were meant to be more social people. So I might be myself. I love crowds. I love being around people. So you tell me I got to stay here or I got to be two doors down from my, my right hand man there is, is kind of like troubling. Troubling. So, so Chris, so how do you, so what are you doing, or, you know, to uh, maintain like your, your mental health? You know, during this time, uh, I try. I kind of. I try to take my mind off certain things. Try to be more creative. Like, so most I've been just putting my time and energy into my like my clothing line, my clothing line, because that's helped me more on the creative side and just kind of keeping my sanity. Because you can't really, like, I can't. I haven't seen my grandmother in months. Not two of my great grandmothers, both of them in their nineties, nineties, seventies, and in their sixties. So I haven't been able to see them, uh, certain siblings, my, my younger ones, the infant ones. Then I had a few family members that died because of this. So just been staying away from certain people, which kind of hurt me because I'm more family oriented. But it kind so of now, yeah. So now, you know, we're, we're, you know, all this is going on and like we're, um, you know, you're home. And then like the next thing we, you know, and these are life, these are life experiences that you know you and I both as, as black men have experienced. Like then we then it's, it's protest. There's you know um, there's George Floyd and, and you know there's there's Aubrey in Georgia and, and all of, and and this tension is you know kind of increased, right? So as a student athlete, you know, headed to you know Old Dominion, coming from DC, like how has that impacted the way you kind of like look at your, your yourself and society, you know, moving forward? Well, looking on that, it kind of, per, per se, it's kind of, that tension always been there. It just hasn't just awoken out of, out of mid-air. The tension always been there. It's just who was going to be bold enough to act on it. And then me going to, going to ODU for a scholarship as an athlete, it kind of, it kind of make me feel like, where's my voice? Like, where do, like, where do I really stand? Am I just this livestock? This uh, show button for you guys to entertain, and I pose I'm less than a person now because you look back on it now more now more so athletes are starting to speak up and be more vocal. But like when Kaepernick and when Kaepernick spoke up and the other people on it, they lost their job. I'm expressing my First Amendment, so now you saying the sport I love is above the law. What you saying? My rights as a person, I can't express myself without losing my job. So it'd be more fearful, more hesitant to speak on certain things in that nature. But now I see more people reaching out with LeBron. LeBron been speaking out, but he can he can afford to lose his job. He got other endorsements, other other aspects. He got the barbershop with uh, HBO. He got his his Nike deal. He's fine. But what do I leave the average person? You know what I'm saying? So it make you feel like, where's your work? Like, who am I? Just kind of learning that for myself. So uh, as a as a as a as a player, and then think about you know kind of coaches, like how can coaches best be supportive for players like you during this time? Uh, they can be best supportive just by like 
like most of what we've been doing, we're having like mental conversations. We try to find a little small community places to go to and just mental check up, you know what I'm saying? Just hearing somebody else's voice and just like like kind of like being more relatable. Don't try to, don't try to like, if we gonna sit right here and come and have a conversation, don't talk at me, talk to me. Try to be one with me because you, we been through, we all have different stories, but we all been through kind of like the same thing. You grew up in DC, I grew up in DC. I lived in South, I'm living in Southeast now. I was originally raised up up Northeast, but you've been through the whole South your whole life. And we we kind of been through the same struggles. We we have we have family members on drugs. We have alcoholic family members. We have close ones that died. We would all seen some traumatic things, so we all just gotta go back by that way. So being more relatable. And like that part around relatability, I think is, is important because I think oftentimes, and I think we, we talk about this in this, in this meeting, um, in, this, in, this, in this panel is one of, the, one of the key things people mention is being relatable. But like, where does authenticity fit in with relatability in your opinions? How can you, as a, how, how do coaches to you come off as trying to be authentic, but they're not? How does that impact you as, a, as an individual trying to be connected with them? Uh, some... Well, I was always taught to see through the BS. So, so some, well, you got to learn the person for them. So some, some coaches, they throw the whole thing off when they try to be posing or something that they're not. Some coaches you see is real genuine. And some coaches, you know what I'm saying, they just don't care. They either, they want you for you, what you can do on the field. They don't care about you as a person. I've experienced all those. Then... It's the phrase next man up, like when you down, next man up. I always seen that as a driving point, but now looking back on it and see what you're saying on mental health. So you basically saying I didn't matter from the stop. Like, you saying I didn't care about you or are right, you down, so that's you alone. So it's just saying you use me. What's the other, other, at the end of the day, I get that, I feel it, but now it's more so I gotta depend on my other things, so now, I can't use my sport as my license anymore. I got to bank on other things. Like if I'm more social, I can speak out more, focus on my other, focus on my other traits, my other, my other skill set. So Ben, but like back onto the question, certain coaches, certain people shouldn't be coached, but we allow them to be coached anyway. Some I know me and my experiences and me going through what I've been through, I know more of the sport than some people they call coaches. I think it's well, something that's true. I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening, Keyshawn. You can And I was saying, like, because some people, some people just did for the check. Some people are really, truly passionate and want to see other players thrive and become young men. That's why I tip my hat off to Coach Fuller, because at, at HD, he always say, I'm teaching gentlemen first, students second, athletes third. And he always carried that. He always seen us as his children. His children were, even when throughout the school day, he PE teacher, he correct you when you're wrong. He, he didn't pick you up, he didn't harm you. And he always been like, he say, once you get in these doors, you're basically my child. And I gotta teach you, I gotta carry you as such. So I always love for that. I got, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw something out that I was, I was sharing the conversation earlier around um, a lot of this stuff. So. I believe uh, coaches need to go through trainings, better trainings, trainings around uh, mental health and, and life skills, things of those natures. What I find is coaches often care more about the tenacity of an athlete, but they never question where that tenacity comes from. They never ask like, you know, this, this young man who uh, has a, a straight edge, who wants to hit hard, who, you know, has, a reckless abandon when he's on the field, he plays like this, he, you know, he, he, he is this thing. But they never stop to question, like, where that comes from. And I think yeah. part of the problem we have within our sports kind of space is coaches are so focused on uh, having players play at that, you know, that reckless kind of space. They never stop and ask that young man or young woman, like, kind of how you feel, uh, what you want to do, where you're coming from. Uh, when, what, what do you do when you're low, your lowest points? Where have you been? Um, and I ask that question to you. Um, has any coach um, been working with you around, like, kind of like your your low end? It's like, how do you how do you find support when you're at your low from coaches? 
Uh, well, recently I've just been more expressive towards how I feel. So if I don't tell you, you don't know. My modes, like on an emotional standpoint, the people that been for this now, I turn. Like, cause they they know me for me. They know my body movement. They know how I I I move. They know my traits for my facial expressions, body movement, so forth, so forth. So, like on a culture standpoint, you wouldn't know if I ain't tell you. You'll just see. Well, sports and uh, basically football around is built upon raw emotion. That's what that's what it is. It's just raw emotion and you do strength. You let all your anger, your pain out within this time period. That's what, and that's been one of my main vocal points in my game is how I tie like controlling my anger, but not like using it for a right purpose. But standing let it control me, I'm controlling it. Well, and then I can kind of put it like this, if you're not, like it for the people that's not understanding. Like Ray Lewis, he found, he, his motor was what got him really going was seeing his mother get beat beat on every day. Beat on every day. That's why he came up with the 52 card scenario and how he was saying, I'm going to get big and stronger. The next man that touched my mother, I'm going to be prepared for it and I'm going to get this out of his lifestyle. That's another scenario. Brett Favre, he had one of the best games of his career when his dad paid. Sorry to say that. Sorry he had to go through that. But he used that anger, that that emotion, that all that to drive his game. So it's a good side to it, and it's a bad side to it. So and then so, you, so when I'm when I'm also hearing uh, you kind of mention, and this I think it's important for all coaches to kind of understand, is like you know, your parents understand like you. They understand like kind of your facial expressions, body language, they understand like all the things that like kind of make you you the unspokens right and a lot yeah. of coaches aren't really diving deep to really try to understand the unspokens they often look at the unspoken unspokens as pro, as a protest against their coaching style or against their win and like in order for like you know coaches to really kind of step to the plate and be better like i think kind of mentors supporting young people along this like this pathway is like really like instead of like trying to be the individual who goes into that piece around you know uh discipline in the moment is really like trying to like seek understanding around the player's kind of position and then move on from there to understand kind of how you move that person to make it where they might want to go. Would yeah. you agree or would you not agree? Come again. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. Then you're just taking that extra step. Like for you, like just putting you an example. All of us, like if you play for you, you know that you care as us as individuals. You done took us different places. You showed us that it's more than just, oh, this street corner right here, or you put things in motion. You, like, for example, you said you want to be an entrepreneur. You got me, you put things in place and you helped me meet other people that were entrepreneurs, that are entrepreneurs, that made millions of dollars off what they want to do. And that, uh, man, you're just taking that initiative. So I agree. So, um, Part of it, I think we are probably going over time too. Um, my last thing before we go is just, what are three things you think coaches should be considering um, adding to their repertoire um, to make themselves better coaches? Well, and well, the three things is actually, like I said before, actually seeing that player's lifestyle. Because then knowing, like, then knowing, using what you got, making the best of what you had. Some some programs are uh, some programs have terrible funding. So just some have terrible funding. Like compared to an IMG, HD is poor to them. They got the top of the line weight room, top of the line coaching staff, uh, meal plan. So I just say using the best of your sources and like knowing your play. You only as strong as your weakest link. And knowing your play, some of me per se. I, I kind of, I don't, I don't get moved by people yelling me, yelling at me. I mean, I, I can take, I take everything in consideration. I'm not the emotional guy. You yell at me or you get on me. I right, just want to motivate me. It's going to get me going. You're talking to me reckless. It's going to get me going. But some people don't move how I move. Some people, you yell at them, you put them down. They don't make the situation worse. Some people, you pull to the side. 
Hey man, you good? You okay? That bring them up. So they don't get ready. And then I think um, you know, I, I hope we're, I think we're done. <laughs> I apologize. We, I, we could have went on forever. No, I want to thank you both so much for that conversation. We really uh, hope to continue it in the Q&A portion, actually. Um, and I'm very sorry to cut you all off. Um, but want to thank you for, for walking us through a really important conversation, um, especially focusing on how coaches can be attentive to kids' experiences that impact their mental health and what they're bringing to the sports that they play. Um, so joining us now um, is Chris Moore from the, C uh, the CEO of Positive Coaching Alliance, who will help us to continue to define the problem and suggest tangible practices to guide our return to play. So Chris, it's all you. Thank you so much. And thanks to the Aspen um, Sports and Society team for inviting me. So at Positive Coaching Alliance, our mission is to transform the youth sports culture into what we uh, refer to as a development zone, where all youth and high school athletes have a positive character building experience. And that's especially important uh, right now as um, when you consider the fact that uh, spring, the spring sports season was cut short due to COVID-19. Some kids lost out on an opportunity to be uh, seen by a, a college uh, scout. Uh, schools re resorted to e-learning uh, with parents becoming substitute teachers. Many kids missed out on proms, graduations, birthday parties, and even today, um, as the summer kicks off, many state in many states, community pools are closed. Uh, summer camps aren't happening. If you're like, if they're like my kids, there are no sleepovers. Kids can't really hang out with their friends, and so what you have here um, are many traumatized kids out there and coaches who are trained. Uh, in social and emotional learning can impart uh, some of these approaches uh, onto their players and they can help de-stress players, dial down some of the anxiety that they may be feeling and then offset some of the trauma that, um, that their players may have experienced. So what are some actionable strategies that coaches can implement? Great question, I'm glad you asked. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so we have, uh, as, as youth sports slowly open back up with a return to practice and competitions in some cases, there are three fundamental strategies that PCA recommends for coaches that will enable them to support their players' social and emotional well being. The first is it, it involves creating a caring climate, the second is filling emotional tanks. I'm going to go through uh, these uh, in detail, and the third is to coach for mastery. Next slide, please. In the youth sports ecosystem, just like uh, in, in academia where uh, teachers play this role or at home where parents play this role, uh, in youth sports, coaches are the key adult stakeholder who are poised to foster a, a culture of, of caring, a, ca a caring climate which is defined by Mary Fry, who is a PCA National Advisory Board member, and she's also the Director of Sports and Exercise Psychology at University of Kansas. She describes it as a, a climate where everyone involved with the team is treated with kindness and respect, uh, one in which people feel uh, comfortable, valued, and welcome. A caring climate allows athletes, through their relationship with their coach or teammates, to deal with tough losses. Uh, or cope with performance issues. Um, there are times where players have issues at home and the coaches step in to help them navigate some of those issues. So coaches, um, they play an important role. They, they need to have the ability to teach players how to manage their emotions, how to deal with conflicts. I, I have a son who played travel baseball. He was a pitcher, um, starting pitcher. And when, he, uh, when the coach uh, made the uh, visit to the mound and signal to the bullpen. My son just had a meltdown and it was really helpful to have a coach who was nur a nurturer and, and um, who could help um, tell him it's okay. Uh, next slide, please. So a caring climate, uh, you know, here are three concrete ways that coaches can begin to plant the seed for a, a caring climate. Number one, talk to athletes about the team they want to have Ask the players, what would it mean to really care, you know, for, for one another as, as teammates? 
uh, not just when things are going well, but during times of adversity, when you're on a losing streak, for example. Um, how, how do you feel? How did this game make you feel? So asking those questions rather than telling the player how they should feel. Uh, number two, create a daily connection with each athlete. At every practice and game, make a connection with each athlete so they know um, you care about them as individuals and as someone who means more than just uh, playing the sport, for example. Number three, uh, coach athletes on how they can support each other. Make this central to, uh, to the team culture and, and point, uh, point it out whenever it, it happens. So the key takeaway is here is to create a supportive and safe space that allows athletes to deepen their relationships. And in doing so, they learn many of the life skills from the relationships they forge with their coaches, uh, and again, at school with their, with their teachers, with their parents, uh, and with their peers. Next, uh, next slide, please. So in our view at Positive Coaching Alliance, um, it's, it's difficult for coaches to create a caring climate unless they understand and commit to what we call filling the emotional tanks of their athletes. Let me explain the concept. We all have an emotional tank that metaphorically works like the gas tank of a car. Your emotional tank fuels your performance. Athletes with empty emotional tanks, uh, they tend, they don't go very far, right? They, uh, you know, they, they, are, they tend to be pessimistic, um, they may give up easily, and uh, in, in some cases they're less coachable. By contrast, athletes with full emotional tanks tend to be optimistic. They deal with adversity. They have a positive attitude and they're more coachable. So coaches are always either filling or draining, as it were, the um, emotional tanks of their athletes through their, their coaching style, their philosophies and their practices. For example, uh, a coach who's considered a tank drainer is probably being overly critical. They shame their players. Uh, they use sarcasm to make their points. They, they embarrass the players in front of the team. They frown upon them. Uh, whereas the tank filling coaches always provide positive, um, constructive and instructive feedback. Again, a full emotional tank allows the athlete to perform better. Next, uh, next slide, please. Here's a, a simple gauge or e-tank tool. Um, you know, all the research and coaching, learning, relationships and business all point to this ratio. Uh, five times as much tank filling to tank draining. So the optimal performance occurs when athletes rec receive five pieces of positive feedback to every one uh, criticism. We call this the magic ratio. It, it, it produces the best learning environment, it strengthens relationships, and it's, it's motivating. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the, the third tiered strategy is to coach for mastery. Let's, uh, let's compare and contrast a scoreboard versus a mastery definition of, of winning. While uh, scoreboard definitions concern with results, the mastery definition focuses on effort. As a coach, it's important to praise effort um, and not the results. That's how players grow. And it's one of those foundational principles that um, our nearly 200 trainers across the country, as they're doing workshops with partners, um, they train, they teach athletes about, which is having a growth mindset and, and praise the person over the process. Scoreboard focuses on comparisons with other players. You know, am I better than him or uh, than him, uh, or is she better than me? Mastery instead focuses on comparison with yourself. Am I learning and, and am I improving? And finally, there's the whole issue of mistakes. Um, in a scoreboard environment, mistakes are not okay. Um, and and that's, that comes across with many coaches. In a mastery environment, however, mistakes are okay. In fact, mistakes are embraced as learning opportunities that can maximize improvement. Coaches can teach players the whole concept of accountability and taking responsibility for the mistakes, um, you know, and the athlete can in, in turn learn and, and grow. 
Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, my screen's a little slow here. Um, and then uh, the mistake ritual. Uh, mistakes can be like a, a, a time machine, right? Um, uh, sorry, my screen is flickering a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, they can keep an athlete fixated on something that has already happened instead of the most important thing, which you hear coaches talk about all the time is the next play. So a mistake ritual is a gesture phrase that coaches and players use oftentimes to remind themselves that mistakes are okay and, and to communicate that they are moving on to the next play. Some examples are you hear um, coaches or even teammates say, flush it, no, sw no sweat, brush it off. Again, this goes back to having um, a growth mindset and believing you can always get better. Mistakes happen, they're part of, you know, especially physical mistakes are, are part of the game, but it's, it's the effort that um, is essential to improving. So to summarize, there are three key strategies for social and emotional learning for coaches to consider as they return uh, to play. They are creating a caring climate, fill your players' emotional tanks and not drain them. And then finally, um, coach for mastery. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Chris, uh, for sharing your insights and best practices. Oops, got the video started. <laughs> um, with us as we work together to put life skills at the center of youth sport experiences um, in our return to play. So. What we're gonna do now is bring back all of our panelists to uh, answer as many questions as we can during this uh, short 12 minute period. Um, and for this, I will turn over to our deputy director, Jennifer Brown Lerner, who will facilitate this portion. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. And thank you to all our panelists. We had a lot of questions come in um, and we're gonna do our best to address all of them. And um, while folks uh, are talking about this in the context of return to play, um, we recognize that today we weren't focused on necessarily the physical health and some of the physical, the um, uh, weren't returned on the requirements that our local and state health authorities are talking to us about return to play, but taking a more holistic view. Um, and while we talked about coaches, I wanna be clear that we were talking about all the folks that were involved in the youth sports endeavor. So coaches, athletic trainers, parents, and even athletes themselves. Um, and so I ask our panelists to take that in mind as we launch into some of our questions. And I'm gonna start first with um, Keyshawn because there were a lot of questions that folks had about your future, Keyshawn. And so they were curious um, what, if any, have you heard from Old Dominion about uh, what the fall might look like and if you've been in touch with your future teammates during this time? Uh, yes, I have been in touch with my future teammates. We're kind of we kind of learning each other out, kind of building that bond without like more FaceTime calls and things like that. But on the situation on going to campus, it's still undetermined, but they're saying we may have a chance to go down there sometime in July. So I'm looking forward to it, but you never know until you know. I'm still banging on that because I heard it was a situation when Bama, they tried to practice for a week, like seven people attracted COVID. I hope it's not true, but I don't, I wouldn't take that risk. I miss, I miss being on the field, you know what I'm saying? It's my, it's my home away from home. Um, totally understand. Um, and, you know, you shared with us that um, oftentimes players uh, build special relationships with their coaches and are able to share um, things that are affecting, affecting them outside of um, the, play, you know, their team environment, the playing field. Um, curious if you've ever felt like um, that has impacted your playing time in any way. Uh, come again. So if you let a coach know that something's going on kind of outside, like you're a little anxious about returning because of COVID, do you think that that's gonna impact your playing time in the future? Uh, no, because I don't, I don't really think so because we're all, I mean, we're all new to the program. Well, for my program, speaking of my program, 
all of us are new. It's a whole new entire coaching staff, new players. So it would be impossible, like, kind of kind of putting what you're saying to words with more so favoritism and me getting out there, you know what I'm saying, certain words to certain words today. Because it doesn't matter what you get down there. Because all oh, now you gotta go into you gotta go into play. You gotta show me what you're talking about on the field. You gotta show me that you know the play. And I, I take pride on my playbook, you know where I gotta be, when I gotta be there, and nobody can match my mode. I, I love the sport. I, I, I say I said on interviews time before, you don't have to agree with me, but so be it. I'm willing to I'm willing to down the field because I, I love what I do. I don't see me going on now, now but this. Great. And, and Donald, I'm hoping that you can jump in here. Um, and folks are curious if you could just give a little bit more background about Seoul and the men's group that you opened up uh, talking about. Oh, you're muted. All right. So um, our men's group is a is a program that meets once a week and is for uh, really all young men uh, at HD Wilson, any school we're in really, to come in and talk about issues that like impact us as, as young black men. Um, and the, one of the big parts around it is a, is a safe space to be vulnerable. We have all these athletes and young men who, some young men have been, been um, you know, shot in the streets. They, they join these groups and we talk about kind of where you are, where you want to go. Talk about entrepreneurship, we bring in speakers. Um, it's again, a way to like show young people that like it's more than kind of what's in front of you, that the world is bigger than that. And you don't have to be um, you don't you don't have to be a uh, a, a victim to I say this like the sports industry. You don't have to be a trophy on the wall um, and then be used by a school or whatever because you you know you, all your dreams are tied up into this one thing and didn't work out. There's entrepreneurship. There's other things you can do to be successful in life. So that's kind of what it is. It's really a safe space for young men to be born. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, Chris, I'm gonna ask you to take this question first and then Rebecca um, and then Tana, I'd like for you to answer it after they go. Um, at what age do you think we really should start working more intentionally with children, particularly in the sports environment about this broader set of skills? About just the uh, skills of social, that deal with social- the social emotional, the life skills, yeah. I, I think, it, it can it can certainly occur at the earlier ages, um, but particularly when you get into results focused environments, um, you know that's when I think uh, when, when it, it it really matters. Uh, parents, there's a lot of stresses uh, imparted on the kids by their parents about securing scholarships and going to college. It's, you know, for a recreational player, it's meant to. Um, be, be more of a, a fun experience. It should be fun for all the sports, but I think it, the, the higher up you go on the uh, development pier, pyramid, it becomes, um, parents become hyper-focused on getting their kids seen by a scout and, and the like. And so I think these skills, while they apply at all ages, um, they're, they're especially critical in keeping athletes who are 12, 13, 14, uh, grounded as well. Yeah, um, I certainly take the um, public health perspective around skill building and think that uh, foundational skills should be built as early as possible so that when you have a performer who is in elite sport, um, they're built into their DNA. And so when you have someone who's up against something, um, they learn these when they're three or when they're four. Um, but that's my perspective as a mental health professional. And Keyshawn, if you could take that question and say, when did you, at what age were you more intentional about your own mental health? Well, I feel like, I wish I would have learned it more at a young age. Like, I feel as though once you start playing a sport, you should learn about the mental side of the sport. Because at that fourth quarter, when everybody's fatigued, tired, that's when your mental game comes to play. It's more so, that's what you think. But, so I wish I would have learned it very young. But I really I really started learning about like mental health. I always knew it was a mental side of the game, but like mental health and how I come to play with your daily life. I learned that my senior year. My senior year of high school. And I'm still, still learning it 
to this day. But when I say speaking with child, I'm saying I feel as though like you should really start learning it, like focusing on it more your 10th grade of high school. Like once you're playing an elite sport, because now it's unfocused stresses on that player. Because now you worry about, oh, am I going to get a look from these universities? Am I going to get a look from these universities? Oh, yeah, I got to focus on my grades here. Now I'm learning the different processes. Oh, will I get playing time? Do I have enough for my huddle account? Oh, do I got to go to this camp here? Oh, do I got to go work out here? So now it's, just, it's more things. The world is starting to hit you a little bit more different than when you're a younger kid because everything is sold out for you. Everybody has playing time. As children pop one and everything, everyone has to get playing time. Once you cross that that varsity, junior varsity bridge, you don't got to smell it through. You don't even got to make a team. So that's when I say more of the mental mind comes to play. The more of a mental aspect comes to play. Donald, did you want to chime in? Oh. Uh, sure, I do. I do. Um, I think also along with that, so, um, so in the – what we work at in DC, um, the school we work in, we work in the second most economically disadvantaged um, part of the city. Uh, we have young people who uh, live in food desert, et cetera. Uh, we see a lot of violence and, and things of that nature. So a lot of our young athletes, and we, and I will say we have one of the better football teams in the city um, and really good athletes. And we, we do have a lot of edge, that edge that comes with the players that we, that we have. Um, but at the same time, I think like this whole conversation around mental health is so important because it goes beyond just the student athlete We're looking like into the family, right? So a lot of times the young students or the student athletes are connecting with us as coaches, not just because we're coaches, but because we represent like either a gateway to something, an opportunity, or we represent like a missing boy um, along their, their like kind of engagement or the development process. So like, the, the conversations around mental health are important, but also the trainings for coaches are so important around this, like understanding how to be active listening, understanding how to like really like uh, diffuse conversation, diffuse conflict. Like on our on one of our teams, we had two people who have been shot in conflict from rival neighborhoods and they had to play on the same team and then they can't walk home. Um, so how do you deal with like the stress of like, you know, the trauma of being shot the trauma of kind of coming together, the trauma of trying to get home, and then trying to like deal with all the different pieces around that, uh, whether it be friends or peers who don't see the things the way you see things as a student athlete, or family members who, you know, are also doing their own traumas. So I think the conversation around mental health and the way that we work and we do this stuff has to go way beyond just like on the field, uh, as it like kind of things we do as coaches has to kind of, um, uh, find his way into like the household and even the teachers a lot of times like working with teachers and, and talking through um, some of the things that the challenges they're seeing. I think it's it's a, it's a huge it's a huge thing. It's it's a very complex process that has to be kind of examined. Yeah, and I know that we are getting close to the end of our time, and there are many more questions that we could take, and we're going to do our best to follow up with some of the panelists and try and get some good, some additional good advice for them. But just as a parting thought, I'm going to ask each one of our panelists um, to respond to this question. Um, as we think about return to play, and here we've really talked about this critical role of coaches in being um, a leader of a, of a team um, and creating an environment that allows young people to focus um, holistically on their health, on their physical health, but also their mental or social emotional health. What's the one thing that you think coaches should do during this time, this kind of almost when we're back to play time, um, to prepare for what's next. Chris, we'll start with you, then go to Rebecca, Donald, and Keyshawn will give you the last word. I think it's it's mission critical for coaches to um, to communicate with their their players, especially especially now when um, many are still not on the field and in and PCA has created a whole platform that'll uh, call life is a team sport that allows um, uh, it's, it's a platform that allows coaches to engage with their players and for us to engage with coaches, uh, but uh, allowing, you know, having team chats and online practices using tech as a, as an enabler 
uh, for them to stay in close contact uh, with their players. Uh, I think that's really important communication right now. Uh, player safety is is a, is an issue that that all coaches and administrators and man, league managers and others are going to have to uh, grapple with uh, until there's a, a vaccine available for COVID. But for now, I think communication and leveraging all the tools and resources that are available to allow um, th that player and coach and, and the teammates uh, to connect. Great points, Chris. Um, two things. One is you as the coach are the medium for all interventions. So you need to regulate yourself. So you make sure that you're in a good space and then also assess your players. So know where they're at, know their benchmarks. Um, Keyshawn put it well when he said, my coaches know how I move. They know me well. Um, and then once you make an assessment, make a plan for when your coach, where you, when your athletes Come back to the field. So if you're on this webinar, then you're learning. So you're um, coming up with interventions to take your assessment and then move it onto the field. And last point is this is heavy information for many. Many people do not learn about mental health all the time. So after this webinar, please take care of yourself. Donald. Yeah. All right. Uh, for me, uh, I think, I mean, I, I echo everything everybody's saying. I think, um, I mean, the key is going to be communication for understanding. So like seeking to understand exactly where players are mentally. Um, there's a lot of young people who are uncertain about college as a, as a thing now. You know, there's a huge break here. They, they're uncertain about the academics as well as kind of like where they'll be. Um, so really having a conversation with young people about that. And I think the other part is always seeking to provide value to where they are. So we, um, we do wellness checks, but in our wellness checks, we're asking about food, we're asking about food insecurity, we're asking about these things. And sometimes kids stick you up in those offers, sometimes they don't. But I think the most important thing is that these young people know that you're like thinking about more about their life than just the, the sport. Chisan, I'll give you the final say here. I feel special, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, more so, I'd say the coach is building a bond now, like just random check of like, hey, kid, how you doing? We think about you. You know what I'm saying? Them, them go a long way. It's just the, the little things that matter. So just taking that initiative and being being the, the head of the team, you know what I'm saying? Because without, without a strong coach, it's, it ain't no program. Well, you know what I'm saying? You the head of how you the you the engine. You the engine. Without that engine working, this team ain't going. The car ain't going nowhere. So just building that bond, getting that relationship with everybody. Because the player trusts you, they'll go through a wall for you. I, I firmly believe that I stand on that. So just building a relationship, showing that you care other than just a player as a person as well. And they'll go a long way. Thanks, Keyshawn, and I'm going to invite my colleague Rania back on to close this out by sharing some upcoming uh, additional events from Project. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, and thank you to all of our panelists, uh, Donald, Keyshawn, Chris, Rebecca, for, for sharing some really important um, insights today and, and some guidance for how we can move forward. Um, I'd like to thank our team as well, Jennifer, Fumi, John, Emily, Marty, and Tom, and to all of you, our Project Play Network for joining us here today. Um, as a reminder, you can please sign up for our newsletter and that's where we'll be sharing our upcoming webinars um, where we'll deep dive into strategies to navigate these times and empower you to be an effective agent of change. Um, if you don't already follow us on social media, we are at Aspen Inst Sports and for the uh, you can check there for our latest project play reports as well. Our next webinar is going to be on June 24th at 12 p.m. And we will focus on reimagining school sports as we look to the future of play. The link for registration is live um, and is has been shared in the chat. And we hope to see you there. Thank you all. Stay safe. Be well and see you soon.